Hey everyone, my name is Carissa. And my name is Tyler. And welcome to the Christ Fellowship Young Adult YouTube channel. We are the Young Adult Ministry of Christ Fellowship Church in South Florida. We're a community of young adults who love Jesus, are seeking after his purposes for us so that we can transform the culture around us. And we're so glad that you've made it here. And while you're here, go ahead and take a second to hit the subscribe button, get connected to all that we're doing, and you'll never miss a beat. Here you'll find a new message every week curated just for our young adults community that we get from Thursdays or 7.30 gatherings. You'll be able to watch and listen to our very own podcast, the Young and Adulting Podcast. Look out for all our special original music, content, and more from our young adults team. Yeah, check out the description below for more info on who we are, what we do, and how you can be a part of it. And share this page with a friend who needs to jump in and be a part of this community. Well, welcome to the CF Young Adults YouTube channel. We are so grateful uh, that you guys are joining us for a Thursday night. Who was that? Who was that skate night last last Thursday night? Anybody get their skate on? Come on, somebody! I didn't fall or tear my ACL, which is all I was I was aiming for. I didn't go fast, but I moved. Come on, that's all that's all you need. Don't gotta go fast. You just gotta get somewhere. Uh, but hey, my name is Alec. If you got a chance to meet yet, I get to be one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship and just get to open uh, the Word of God with you today. And we've been in this series called To Be Continued, uh, TBC. Uh, and tonight, we're gonna be working through the book of Acts. And just to give you a quick recap, uh, week one, we looked at Acts 1 and Acts 2, where the Holy Spirit lit the church on fire and thousands were saved and baptized. Uh, and then week two, y'all remember the tables? Come on, how could you forget the tables? We all sat around, we broke bread together and got to see how the early church uh, really did life together. And now we're gonna be jumping in really to see how is the church evolving? How is the church moving? And to give you just a quick recap before we get to our scripture tonight, after Acts 2, some, some weird stuff happens. Uh, a husband and wife, they die because they lied. It's in there, the Bible's not boring. You can read about it. Uh, Peter's shadow was healing people. Guys, telling you, it's in there. And then suddenly uh, the apostles, they get to this place where they realize that they can't manage the move of God anymore. And they appoint seven other people to kind of help them as overseers. And we get to this one story in Acts chapter seven. So we're gonna be picking up tonight, but it's uh, about this guy named Stephen. And Stephen was one of the overseers and he was actually in the town square telling people about Jesus. And suddenly these two Greek guys walk up and he's telling them about Jesus. And these people uh, are actually so turned off by what he said that they went to the religious leaders of the day and they basically lied about him. They basically turned this guy in for talking about Jesus. And Stephen is brought in on trial on the spot, and basically Stephen gives this testimony of Jesus. He's telling the religious leaders, hey, you've missed it. The Messiah has come. His name is Jesus. And the religious leaders, I kid you not, they literally cover their ears and start yelling because they are so disturbed about what this man is saying. And suddenly, uh, Stephen is our first martyr in the book of Acts. He's actually stoned for his belief in Jesus. And in that moment, the church is like persecuted, it, it's, it's scattered. And I wanna pick up in Acts chapter eight, verse one, because we get this really crucial figure come on the scene. And in Acts chapter eight, verse one, it says this, and Saul approved of their killing him. The church was persecuted and scattered on that day. A great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and except all the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So off the bat, we see that there's one man that's really behind the killing of Christians. And it's this man by the name of Saul. And we've probably all heard of Saul before. And before we get into what Saul's experience is, I think it's important for us to actually know who, who is Saul? Well, why does he act the way that he does? And, and Saul, he's from a small town called Tarshish. He was raised in the religious law. So think about like a newborn all the way up until their adulthood, just being in church every day. Like this, they're just always there. Like pastor's kids, like me. Um, right, he was just there. He was always in church. So he was an expert in the law. He knew everything about the law, but also Paul, sorry, Saul. Saul was a man of great zeal. Now, zeal is not a word that we use a lot right now, but zeal means great passion, great enthusiasm, and it's kind of like over the top. 
Like, you know that one Miami Heat fan, you're like, all right, bro, chill. Chill, chill, we get it, you like the heat. Like that, he had some zeal and some passion about him that could not be contained. Now, like we said, he was trained in the Old Testament law. He knew the law better than anybody else. And this is the thing. In Old Testament law, basically, they predicted the Messiah would come when the law was followed to the letter. So think about that for a second. You're raised your whole life knowing that, man, if we live the law to the letter of God, we might see the Messiah come. So Saul does not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So you can start to see off the bat, there's a bunch of old Jewish people now becoming Christians. And you can think for a second, the Pharisees are looking at them saying, you're messing it up. Like, like you, you have no idea what you're doing. You're actually not bringing the Messiah here to earth. And because of that, we need to get, we need to get rid of you. You're actually turning the world upside down for the wrong reason. And what's funny enough, Jesus actually predicted this. If you look at John chapter 16, it says this, it says, for you will be expelled from the synagogues and the time is coming when those who kill you will think they're doing a holy service for God. So off the bat, Jesus has actually already predicted what Saul is doing in the room. Saul was a man of great zeal, but his zeal was focused in the wrong areas. His, his zeal was actually focused in the wrong places. And tonight, as we work through uh, Saul's story, we're just gonna be asking three questions tonight. And the first question is this, have I misdirected my zeal? Have I, have I misdirected my zeal? Now, like we said, uh, zeal, I think another word we could say is passion. Like, what am I passionate about? So let me ask the other question. Has your passion been misdirected? And I think as, as young adults, we, uh, it's not a bad thing, but I think we attach ourselves to every movement to every sports athlete, to every celebrity. Some of us read Fox News more than our Bible. Uh, let's be honest. Uh, some of us are more concerned what's going on in the White House uh, than what's actually going on in our hearts and our church. And uh, hear me for a second. None of that is wrong. None of it is wrong. I think it's all good. But the moment we place those things in front of Jesus, our zeal has been misdirected. Our, our zeal has now gone astray. Our passions are out of line. And, and if we could go back and tell Saul, we would say, hey man, like you're pursuing the wrong things. The things that you are pursuing, the things that you think are gonna give you life are actually getting you nowhere. And, and young adults, I, I just wanna encourage you tonight to do a heart check to say, man, wh where, where's my zeal? Wh wh where is it directed? Because I would hate for you to get to the end of your life and think you hit it, think you hit the goal, and you missed it completely. And I just wanna encourage you for a second, what would it look like if man, a room like this that said, hey, my first passion is Jesus. Like, like I, I'm gonna be involved in politics and in the following and everything else, but before that, I'm a Christian. But before that, my zeal is toward the world. Have, have you misdirected your zeal? So Paul, uh, ah, guys, I'm gonna say it all night long. Saul. All right, Saul, he, he goes, uh, basically, Stephen, Stephen is martyred, and, and Saul is now asking the question, hey, are there more Christians that I can go persecute? And he actually goes to, like, his bosses, and he's like, hey, can I go to Damascus? Can I go lead, like, a persecution against them? And they're like, yes, go. So Paul, he starts off on the road to Damascus, and suddenly, I just think, I think suddenly, like a bright light, shines down from heaven. Now, I don't know how bright the light is, but I wanna give you guys a good illustration to how bright it might've been. Have you ever been in your car, like 6.30 in the morning, driving east, and the sun barely gets over the horizon, and it hits your windshield in such a way that even that little flapper thing doesn't do a single thing for you. You're just like, I'm driving blind. I don't know where I'm going. You're going like 10 under the speed limit so you don't hit a dog. Come on, we've all been there. Think about that light, but like 10 times brighter. That's what hit Saul on the road to Damascus. And this is what the scripture says. Acts chapter nine, four through seven. It says, he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. 
The men traveling with the saw stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but didn't see anyone. Y'all, that would be on Stranger Things. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind and did not eat or did not drink. So let's recap for a second. Saul, man of great zeal and passion, is on his way to start persecuting Christians and a light from heaven shines down and says, Saul, Saul, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And in that moment, Saul was instantly blind and done for, right? And I wanna think about this for a second. I want us to put ourselves in the story. Like we said, Saul was a religious leader. He knew the scriptures better than anybody else. And just think about it for a second. The one that you spent your life persecuting, you come face to face with, and you realize that the, he was the fulfillment of the law. Let's think about that for a second. The one you were waiting for is suddenly the one that is stopping you on the side of the road in your tracks. I wonder what it would, what it would look like for Saul to see the face of Jesus, and that was the last thing he saw. Think about it for a second. He went blind instantly after seeing the face of Jesus and he saw nothing at all. Some would say that Paul was blind. I would say that he actually was already blind. He was spiritually blind. But in that moment, he was more alive than ever. Think, think about that for a second. You come face to face with the fulfillment of the law. We've been waiting since Genesis 1-1 for this guy to show up and he's on the scene. And suddenly now Saul can't eat or drink. He is just in disarray. So he gets led into Damascus and basically he's there in a corner. That's why, I don't know, maybe he was. He was in a corner just not eating or drinking, just hanging out. But uh, there's a local church leader by the name of Ananias. Come on, someone say Ananias. Now oh, that was awesome. One more time, Ananias. Now, Ananias was the, the local church leader. You could call him the pastor of Damascus. And uh, Ananias is taking a nap. He's snoozing. And the Lord wakes him up and just says, hey, I need you to go heal the man named Saul. Now, listen, they didn't have Twitter or Facebook, but word still got around. Like, you don't mess with this guy. Like, I, I, just imagine for a second, you're the local pastor. And hey, I'm supposed to go heal the guy that's been killing all the Christians. I would have some reservations. And, I, and actually Ananias did too. And kid you not, so uh, Ananias is kind of like pleading with the Lord. He's like, are, are you sure? And the Lord says something amazing. He says, yes, Saul is gonna be the one that, that takes my message to the ends of the earth. Now Saul, when, uh, when Ananias shows up, uh, Ananias prays for him. They said that he prayed for him. He received the Holy Spirit and something like scales fell from his eyes. Paul received new sight. Paul received new vision. My second question tonight is this, have you received new vision? Have you received new vision? And just for a second, Paul had already encountered the risen Jesus, but his eyesight needed to be restored. And if we're being honest for a second, I think a lot of us, we meet Jesus, and we're so excited about it, and we leave this place, or we leave whatever church we're at, and we see the world the exact same way we walked in before. Friends, that's not how it should be. Second Corinthians says this. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. So Paul is actually writing this later in his life, but he's literally showing, hey, when you become into Christ, you are new. And I just wanna say something real quick. Um, for everyone in the room, if we are to have the vision of Christ, like 2020 vision of Christ, racism should not exist in the body of Christ. It, it, it should not exist in the body of Christ. We should not see color, but we should see souls. We should see a brother and a sister. There should not be any division within our body. Listen, when we look at people, we need to have the vision of Christ that Christ has given us. And if I'm being honest for a second, I feel like some of us need to go to the eye doctor. Have you ever all sat in that chair before? You're looking at the thing, you're like, it's worse, it's better. No, bring that one back, bring that one back, right? And suddenly what? They're, they're trying to get your vision to a place where you're seeing perfectly. But I think a lot of us settle for 1820 or 1920, 
But I think it's time for the body of Christ to say, no, like, I, I wanna see 2020 vision. Like, I, I wanna see how Jesus would see people. And can I be honest for a second? I'm just as guilty as this, but I don't wanna see people for their sin or their situation anymore. But like, and as a pastor, I say that. But like, I wanna have the vision of Christ that when I see a homeless person on the side of the street, I don't just automatically assume what he did wrong. But like, I actually have compassion and I have a heart. And I would say, God, would you give me the vision to see him like you see him? Romans 12, two says this, says, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Friend, I just wanna ask the question tonight, have you received new vision? And I've also had this experience before too, and my wife's gonna laugh at me, I haven't gone to the eye doctor in three years. And I can guarantee you, my eyesight's probably not the best. But I think some of us, we go to the eye doctor, we get 20-20 vision, and we're like, oh dude, I'm set for life. I never have to go back. But I think the truth is, no, it's, it's a constant going back. Saying, God, has the world affected the way that I see? Man, man have my circumstances affected the way that I see people? Man, God, could you do a work on my eyes? That I wouldn't just see people for how I see them, but I would truly see people for how you see them. I feel like we need to go back to the eye doctor. So, so Paul, he, he's, he's been healed, right? Scales fall from his eyes. Now get this, Paul is now a new man. He's got his eyesight back. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And like we said, guys, he already knew the law, so he could start preaching instantly. Like he already knew every message already preached. He's like, his name is Jesus. So Paul goes out into the streets and thousands are being saved at his name. Like my man went from like killing Christians to saving Christians. Like he, he automatic flip overnight. Now, now here's the crazy thing. Uh, Paul, now Paul, the apostle Paul, is now being hunted by the people that were encouraging him to hunt Christians. Like, guys, could you imagine a three-day period? Like, this is nuts. So automatically, Paul is now being persecuted by the Jewish leaders of the day. And this is what it says in Acts 9, 23 to 24. It says, after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night, lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Now, get this for a second. People are literally watching the gates. Like when this man walks through, it's time to kill him, it's time to end him. And suddenly, Paul is in a little room probably with his followers, it's like, what do we do? And they pulled a tail right out of Veggie Tales, yo. They just started lowering this guy out of a basket. Like, I can already think about Larry Boy just like lowering some peas, you know? They're just, they're just getting out of the wall. But suddenly, the people that Paul only knew for a couple of days are being his greatest friends and helping him get to safety so that he can do all that God has called him to do. And my last question tonight is this, is have you found your people? H have you found your people? Well, like, have you found the people that when hell comes against you with everything that it has, that they're not leaving your side, that they're sticking with you through the thick and through the thin, when people are trying to kill you, like, do you have your people that aren't gonna leave your side? And I just wanna encourage you guys for a second, Christianity is never meant to be lived in isolation. But like, it's meant to be lived with people. It's meant to be lived in community. And when we look at the Apostle Paul, countless times my man was knocked down, but people around him carried him when he could not stand. And I honestly would say this, the Apostle Paul would have never accomplished all that he had if it wasn't for the people in his life if it wasn't for the people that followed him, if it wasn't for the people that were with him night and day. And I just wanna encourage you for a second, this life that we live is short, it's fragile, it will be gone one day and a new life will begin. And I just wanna encourage you, who, who are your people tonight? I, I remember uh, 
It was a little more than a year ago last April. My, my dad had passed away from cancer after a five-year battle. And I remember I found myself in the thick of the fight, not knowing what I was gonna do. And I can name the people in this room that were by me, that prayed for me, that lifted my head up when I could not lift my own head up, that encouraged me in the Lord, that said, hey, your best days are still ahead of you. I'm ready to encourage you. And friends, I just wanna encourage you tonight. Battles are coming. I don't know if you're gonna have to be lowered through a hole in a wall, but battles are coming your way. And it matters who you have next to you. It matters who you're doing life with. It matters that come hell or high water, like you have people by your side that aren't gonna leave you. And I just wanna encourage you, who are your people? And if you don't have your people, I want you to look to your left or your right, like my closest friends I met in this building, not because I'm a pastor on staff, but because I planted my life in this house. And when I planted my life in this house, I met people that I didn't even know about but now I call them for lifers, like we're friends for life. They can't get rid of me, I know, right? I just wanna encourage you guys tonight, who are your people? Who are you doing life with? That when the enemy comes knocking at your door, man, you don't have to be afraid, number one, because your God is for you. But man, you got people around you. Would you stand with me real quick? As we close, I just wanna leave you with this thought. A man who was killing Christians, went from killing Christians one day to three days labor, having them saved by the thousands. And some people ask, well, how did he do that? How do you have a life transformation just like that? And, and I would walk us through the points, man. His zeal was transformed. He had new vision and he had people around him. But more importantly, how many people know that there was a guy that spent three days in a grave but rose again and he said, hey, freedom isn't a year from now. Freedom isn't two weeks from now, but freedom is actually in this place. And his name is Jesus. See friends, Jesus came so that you could be set free, so that you could live the life that you were called to live, that you, couldn't have, you don't have to hide in darkness anymore, but you can walk into the light and you can live a life that's worthy of the calling that he has on you. <laughs> because of Jesus, Saul was transformed into the apostle Paul and because of Jesus, you were transformed from who you once were to who you are now. And hallelujah. Because when I look back at my life, thank God he saved me. Thank God he redeemed me. Thank God he changed my life and made me who I am. So friends, as we close, uh, I'm gonna pray a couple of prayers. And I just ask you to just bow your heads with me um, as we pray. And, I would just ask that no one looking around, no one uh, peeking, but I would just, I wanna ask a couple of questions again. Have you misdirected your zeal? And if that's you tonight and you'd say, yeah, I've, I've misdirected my zeal, man, can you just raise your hand? I just wanna pray for you real quick, that the passions of God would, would over, overrule your life, that you would be filled with, with such a passion for Him and the world's second. Praise God, you can put your hands down. Secondly, tonight, and you would say, Alec, I don't see the way that God wants me to see. If you'd be bold enough to say, Alec, I need to receive new vision tonight. Could you just raise your hand as well for me? Praise God. Praise God. Scales are falling off of eyes tonight. Thank you, Jesus. And lastly, tonight, if you had heard that question, have you found your people? And the honest answer is no. I, I wanna pray for you as well. I wanna pray that, that people would surround you, that people would come out of the woodworks just wanting to do life with you. And if that's you in this room and you'd say, man, I haven't found my people yet, but I want to, could you raise your hand for me? No one's looking around. Yep, praise God, come on. So Jesus, we pray for every single hand raised. And God, right now we just start, um, God, with those who have misdirected zeal, God, right now, I pray, that God, that passions would come into order. God, that there would just be a passion for you, that God trumps everything else, that God, the passion for your word and for your church and for the things of you, God, would rule in their lives. And God, I pray that you would use them in powerful ways, God, where they're at. 
God, I pray for the people in the room that need new vision tonight. God, I pray right now that scales would fall off of eyes, that God, you, that they would see how you want them to see, that God, you would give them the 2020 spiritual vision to see this world, to see people, how you see them. God, I pray that you would flood them with compassion right now. That God, when they look on the people that, man, they would be flooded with compassion. God, flooded with compassion to share your word, flooded with compassion to love them. And lastly, tonight, for all of those who you're still looking for your people, God, right now, I pray for every single hand raised. God, right now, I pray that, uh, that God, we as a church, God, would come alongside of these people. God, I pray that people, God, would come out of nowhere, God, wanting to do life, God, with these individuals, that God, they would not walk alone, but God, they would walk together hand in hand through every battle. They would have their people that are right there by their side. And, and lastly tonight, if you're in this room and you, and you don't know Jesus, Jesus can transform your life in a second. And you're saying, Alec, I, I wanna accept Jesus into my heart. I, I want him to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I, I wanna be made new. No one's looking around, all heads are bowed. Can you just slip your hand up for me real quick? I just wanna pray for you. Yep, see it. Yep, I see it. Thank you, Jesus. We're all gonna pray this prayer together. I just ask you to pray it after me to say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you rose three days later. Make me new and I will follow you the best that I know how for the rest of my days. And everybody said, amen, amen.